So when I was asked to come and speak with you uh, this evening, um, I must say I felt a bit of a fraud because, um, and, and I, I, I was saying this to, to, to some folk this evening, that personally, uh, my experience and everything that I'm going to be talking to you about this evening is based on what I do on a daily basis as a, a, a micro business owner. And uh, for 20 years I was an employee and then I was offered some money to go away and I took it gleefully and I set myself up in my, in my own business. And through a long, circuitous route, ended up being uh, my business turning into where I support small and micro businesses um, in terms of things like business planning, branding and marketing. But from a very, very practical, push that button, and if you do that, that will work kind of um, process. Now, the one thing about my own business um, is that as a, a business mentor, I, I specialise in, in, in mentoring uh, small and micro businesses, and also in, in training them. Uh, the, the, thing, the thing about that is that in order to do that, um, I have to have had a business of my own. <laughs> which I have had a uh, successful business and it morphed into what I'm doing now and the one thing that was um, a standard across when I was running my own business and I was my business you know a lot of those of you that call yourself freelancers and that kind of you know, you're a micro business okay um, everything is down to you um, whether your accounts get done whether you deliver to a client whether you market your own business or all, all of it all of it is down to you and the one constant through everything that I did in terms of my initial business and the business that I have now has been the use of email at the heart of my marketing process. And one of the things that I um, am finding quite interesting is there seems to be a resurgence in terms of people recognising email as a valuable piece of kit in, in that marketing toolkit because for a long time all the shiny new stuff took over and people forgot quite a lot of the old standard stuff that was sitting there and I, I've been around long enough to, real, to remember when um, email was new um, and it was the first social media you know the first time that we actually had things delivered to us where we didn't have to put it on a piece of paper and put a stamp on it it was an amazing leap forward so what I'm going to do this evening in, in the time that I've got with you is share with you some of the thoughts, the ideas, some of the things that I do with my own clients, some of the stuff that I've done with my own business in terms of using email as a, an engagement tool uh, because I think it is very, very strongly um, engagement and I hope that you will see that as, as I go through what I'm doing. And I know that we've, um, we've got a Q&A session at the end, however, if I say something and you don't, what the hell is she on about? Or well, just ask me when I'm going through because sometimes you'll forget or I won't even remember what I said. <laughs> so it's probably better to ask me um, as, as we go through. If you want to... <laughs> Stop pointing it at me. It did work, it did work. There we go. Um, if you want to get in contact with me afterwards, <laughs> this is where you will find me. Um, I love that picture because uh, until you meet me, you think that's what I look like. <laughs> uh, and, um, but you can, uh, you can get in contact with me in any of these places. Come and find me. Um, come and connect with me on LinkedIn. Come and find the fact that I, I'm, uh, I am the chief cat cuddler. Um, it's brilliant when you own your own business because you can call yourself whatever you want. So, um, so do, do do that. And if you've got any questions afterwards, drop me an email. Okay, I'd be more than happy to answer for you. Um, right, first things first. Let's think about today, okay, today in your lives, and I'm thinking of you as an individual, not in terms of your work, all right, because uh, thinking about what you do with your work, then it may be skewed slightly, but thinking of you as an individual, um, how many of you have, which way am I pointing it? How many of you have used any of these today? Let's start with Facebook first. Your own private Facebook profile. 
okay? You know, probably just over half, probably two thirds of the room. So who's been onto their LinkedIn profile today? Four people. Um, who's been on Twitter today? A few more. Um, what about Pinterest? <laughs> Instagram? Okay, YouTube? Right. How many of you have checked your emails today? <laughs> Absolutely. How many of you have checked your emails multiple times today? And how many of you are using one of these things yeah. to check your um, emails? Okay. Now, the thing about email is that, and this is what I want to, to part of what I want to cover with you, is the fact that you, I could put any um, selection of social profiles up there. And what would happen is that you would get a variation in the group as to who is using which profile because of personal preference. Um, I personally hate Facebook, but I use it because it's good for my business. I love Twitter. The whole idea of being able to solve the world's ills in 140 <laughs> characters, I, I, just, I just love. I'm, I'm not necessarily a massively pictorial person, but I'm dragging myself kicking and screaming into the other things. And as for making videos, um, yeah, I know I have to do it, but it's not necessarily um, something that I'm coming at, you know, all, all guns blazing. Um, but I, what I do know is that email sits at the heart of what I do on, on, on a daily basis. Um, so if you're not using email as part of the structure in terms of your engagement, then you're missing out on a vast quantity of people that, that would use that as, as their method of, of staying in contact with you or you passing your messages out to them. And I think that the key um, thing here <laughs> that I, I, I say is that we all know word of mouth. <laughs> you know, word of mouth has been there forever and actually with most of the small businesses that I work with and, and the micros that I work with, I'll ask them, okay, what's your biggest methodology for getting people to buy from you or buy into you? And they will say it will be a referral from somebody else, okay? Now increasingly what we know is that those referrals are online. <laughs> They're not necessarily over the garden gate. They may well be via things like Google reviews or TripAdvisor reviews or whatever that might be. I mean, the fact of the matter is that um, in terms of uh, buying into things, so we're looking at purchase decisions, and this isn't just buying products and services. It's actually whether people are prepared to give to charity and all of those kinds of things. Their decision, eight, more than 80% of their decision is based on what they're looking at online and what other people are saying about it, okay? So we need to make sure that that all sits within, within, within what we're doing in terms, of, um, in terms of engagement. And I want to just look at what I call the, the engagement cycle because um, quite often what I find is that there's a bit of a leak somewhere. Uh, people talk about the marketing funnel. I quite often think of it more as a colander because what happens is that people have preferences for, for, what, for what they do and therefore their strength will be in one area rather than necessarily thinking strategically across the whole across the whole picture and I, for me where when i'm looking at where email sits within engaging communities um, it's very much the case that what we're doing is we're gathering information from people who have said that they want to hear about us that they've got an interest in what we're doing um, and quite often the place that will start at will be a website. Not always, but quite often it will start at a website. Where there will be some, usually, some form of invitation to join a mailing list. So JMML, join my mailing list, okay? Um, and as I said, email is having this um, resurgence at the moment. And if you look at any of the um, big American um, business coaches, <laughs> They're all offering programs out there about how to create, you know, that 10,000 mailing list and, and all of that. There's a very, very big um, move towards this. But the thing that we know is that the more people that we engage with, the more people that we've got on our list who have actually said, yes, 
I'm interested in what you do, I want to hear more about what you do, the more likely we are to either get new customers or people donating to charity or people volunteering to do certain, uh, certain types of work. So we take the website, we stick in this, this process of doing something to encourage people to say, yes, I do want to join your list. Now, in a lot of cases, um, what people will do with their websites is they'll stick a nice little box on there saying, um, get our monthly newsletter. How many of you would actually sign up to say, get your monthly newsletter? Well, you crossed your arms, you definitely won't. Okay? <laughs> um, and that's, the, <laughs> that's most people's response because the idea of, of, of getting this thing on a regular basis that has got some kind of almost implication that it's going to be boring and or salesy um, puts people off. Not everybody, some people will, so you, you have to have it there as, a, as an option. What most of us actually do these days is we will share our details in exchange for something. So some form of lead magnet, or a content offer, so you embed something within a blog or something like that that will encourage people to, to share their, their data with you. But the whole point of this is that what you're doing is you're providing them with something that they're interested in, um, and I've done it and you've probably done it sometimes, what you will do is you'll get people sign up, download whatever it is that they want, or get hold of whatever it is they want, and then they will unsubscribe. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Absolutely not, because what you want on your list is you want a valuable, valid list of people. So if somebody just signs up and downloads something, then unsubscribes straight away. That's fine because they've never engaged with you in the first, you know, after that process anyway. Um, so you can get rid of those. But but once you've got that, then it's your job <laughs> to entice and engage. And this is sometimes where the um, where things fall through the cracks. Because even those uh, people on those websites that have you know, join my mailing list to receive my regular update don't necessarily put in place a form of informing those people who have signed up what that actually means. So the classic thing is you have an organisation that you're interested in. In their terms, what they may do is they only, may only mail out to their mailing list once a quarter. Now that, those people that are signing up don't necessarily know that until somebody's told them that's what happens. And quite often what you will do from those organisations is you'll get a little thank you email saying thank you very much for signing up. But what they won't do is say, oh and we mail out every quarter and if you're interested there's, so this whole idea of creating some kind of automatic responsive welcome series so that you embed those people in to your organisation and they feel liked and wanted. And quite often what you'll get is that this is where people, where the unsubscribe comes in, is that they're not sure what they're going to be inundated with. Somebody said to me the other day, they, they signed up for something on somebody's website and within five days they'd had more than 20 emails from this person and they said is that what they should be doing and I said no <laughs> absolutely not um, so it, it's about it's about judging judging your community but you really do need to let them know what it is that they can expect from you as, as time as time goes forward and then you can actually use that as an information tool but you can actually also use it to um, encourage them to engage with you in, in, in other ways and I want to go through some of that as, as I go through, through this evening. Um, the fact is that what that then does is it drives traffic to all of the other places where you want people to, to go um, which then brings them back to your website. I call this the, like, the virtuous circle um, and in fact I'll, I'll tell you what I tend to do with my own stuff um, is that because I'm a one person operation I have to do everything for my business as well as deliver it so in terms of me this circle starts with my blog so I'll, I'll write a blog once a week on something to do. at the moment I'm concentrating on campaign marketing because uh, I've got an offer coming out next week so <laughs> um, that's why I've been concentrating on that now my blog actually then forms the content or part of the content of the newsletter that I send every Monday morning. 
Um, I know whether it's working because I can see what the click-through rate is on that, on that email. Um, I also make sure that I send little and often because that engages people far more and I'll, I'll show you that as we go through. But that blog becomes my social output. So I post it on Facebook, LinkedIn, multiple, multiple times on Twitter. Um, the newsletter itself then becomes my content as well because the newsletter's got a URL. So that goes out on Facebook and on LinkedIn and on Twitter. So from one bit of writing, I'm getting multiple, multiple hits. And the fact is that with my community, the people that I engage with, my customers and my potential customers, is that because they've got their preferences of which social platforms they're using, um, they not only engage with it as a physical thing delivered to their inbox, but they actually engage with it in other places through the week as this information is going out. And I find it really strange, you know, something that I wrote on a Monday at seven o'clock on a Sunday evening, I'll get a ping on my phone and somebody's liked that post on, on LinkedIn. Um, so it actually has that methodology of, of, of pushing it around. And obviously when they're looking at it, um, they're sharing it with their, their community as well. So the whole point of this is to actually increase your community um, because people will trust what their friends trust. Okay. And I think for me, um, I'm probably teaching grannies to suck eggs here, but what when I'm talking about email marketing, I am actually talking about something that is professional <laughs> and the key is about it looking great everywhere. And if any of you are sending out any forms of email communication that is not responsive and if you're not designing it for a handheld device, particularly if you're sending anything out that's got columns, can you please go back and ditch it? because they don't work. They need to be single column. Um, what we're getting is, I mean, 80% of um, internet traffic is on a handheld device, mostly phones. And if people cannot see your message and your main call to action within that small screen right in front of them, you're losing them. Okay, so it, it, needs, it needs to look professional, it needs to, to look good. I always say design for the, um, the smallest and it will look great on whatever you, you use it on. Okay. Um, the other thing is we were talking about writing for banks um, oh, yes. earlier and I'm sure we've all been recipients of these communications from organisations and you look at it and you think, what? <laughs> yeah, and it's full of all that jargony stuff and you've got absolutely no idea what it is that, that, um, that they're talking about. And the key thing is that you will get masses of unsubscribes if they think it's boring. Okay? And even more so, which is even more important, is that you will get people reporting it as spam if they think it's irrelevant. Loads of people that will sign up for things will forget. Within about half an hour, they'll have forgotten. And then they'll say, what's this thing coming into my inbox? And if they find it interesting coming into their inbox, absolutely fine, okay? If they find it, I don't know what this is, um, because it's actually, if you think of a phone, but actually even on a desktop, in terms of the use of your arm, <laughs> It's actually easier to report it as spam than it is to go down to the bottom and unsubscribe. So that's what people do. They click on spam. And the fact is that if you're using um, uh, whatever provider you're using, if they start getting multiple spam reports, they'll block your account. Okay? So you need to make it interesting. You need to make it relevant to the people that, that are coming. And this is where, going right back to what I was saying there about when people signing up on the website, if you haven't set up... Um, uh, what I call a, series, a welcome series autoresponder set that as soon as somebody appears in a particular um, mailing list that they get I would say at least three emails over say a seven to ten day period telling them what they should be expecting um, then that's where you're going to start getting people either signing out or, or, or finding it irrelevant okay 
And for me, this costs money. You know, this is part of my uh, marketing budget. So I have to make sure that it's, it's working and the clients that I'm working with do not have massive budgets. So if they're gonna be investing in this as a part of their marketing process, they've got to know that it's, it's actually having an effect. So if we start looking at the statistics here, um, you know, 88% regularly checking their emails on their smartphones, okay? So this is why the importance of making sure that you design for that format. Um, over and above everything else. That, that is going to increase. Because when I first started talking about this, we were in the 70s, and now we're into the 80s. Um, and what I love, the statistic that more people own a smartphone than own a toothbrush. So, you know, there are some people with horrible teeth um, that are still checking their email. Um, and, you know, 91% of people check their emails daily. Now, this is people. It's not <coughs> in work and it's not just people you know who are um, supposed to be looking at emails this is across the board so it's your gran and, and all of those people are looking at, at, at their emails so thinking about the kinds of folk that you're trying to reach it will get to them okay the reliability of it they have given you permission they've given you their name and they've given you their email address Therefore, when you send this thing out, unless they've misspelled their email um, when they've signed up, or um, unless uh, sometimes when you um, say put a work-based email in, uh, email address in, sometimes there's a firewall issue that can that can affect it sometimes. But generally, you're going to get in front of the person. Okay. Now, and if you're using Facebook advertising, this statistic changes, but generally in terms of organic Facebook posting, the likelihood of you getting in front of your audience is about 2%, okay? Um, because, you know, they might not look at Facebook that day. <laughs> um, and I think this, in terms of conversion as well, it, the fact that you do get a much higher conversion rate within within email and that then goes into your return on investment so um, the stats were uh, collated in the states because most of the main email service providers are American um, so this might change a little bit according to the pound so it was like $45 or something over there but it works out to about 38 pounds here in the UK for, for every pound spent um, so, you know, it is really, really cost effective. Um, the fact is that what you then have to do is you have to tie it in with all of the other things that, that, you're, that you're doing. Um, it's, it's not a standalone, none of them are standalone. And I think for me, the key thing about making sure that it is ethical, um, I don't know whether you get them, but I do quite often emails from people saying, I can get you a 50,000 person mailing list and absolutely no, <laughs> absolutely no, for more than, more than one reason. Um, but what you will find with the vast majority of email service providers, yes, they do allow you to import an expert, export um, Excel uh, uh, spreadsheet, CSV files, etc. But you have to actually specify that these people have said that they are prepared for me to send these things. So importing bought lists, is just not on. This, this is organic growth. Um, this is where, as I say, it comes back to engaging people with stuff that they're interested in and they find relevant and that they want to hear about on, on a regular basis. Um, so you, you do need to get those, those permissions. And interestingly, one of the things about joining my mailing list is that you can get people to do it anywhere. So a lot, yeah, a lot of people put stuff on their website. Uh, they may have it on their uh, Facebook page. Uh, they may have um, something on their Twitter profile, on their LinkedIn profile. But, you know, even coming to something like this, you could come in with a sheet and say, if you want to get our mailings, put your name in your... So there are masses and masses of ways you can get people's permission to actually uh, send them stuff. So it doesn't all have to be um, shiny. Um, it can be old school as well but as long as you do get that permission is key 
Now, I want to get into some practicals about the content and what makes a difference in terms of open rates and click-through rates. Because unless you're sending to your immediate family, it is very unlikely that you will get a 100% open rate. And even then, your auntie won't open it because she'll think it's some kind of scam. Um, so what you're looking at in terms of industry standards is that something around about 38% um, open is okay. Anything less than that, I'd be looking at what's happening. Um, and in terms of click-through, something between about 12 and 18% and you're doing okay. So... Um, do those numbers come from like a particular email platform or something? No, no, that's just across e e okay. email, the email uh, providers industry stats. Right, yeah. okay. Because I, I use MailChimp and I remember that it says that the industry average for like non-profit is like... 20 it may it may um, for, for non-profit organisations and it's sometimes it, that's just generally across the board whether you're a sort of large corporate through to non-profit with a non-profit you might get more they might be slightly higher no, simply no, because 21% open it says is the average so that's lower than oh right yeah. okay and I think the one thing to remember about and this is why the whole thing about open rates um open rate is vanity yeah. <laughs> click through rate is sanity yeah. because pe the open rate can be based on preview screens yeah. because they use a tracking pixel quite often in the emails if you use a, a preview um, screen within your uh, email provider you know your, your personal desktop um, if that gets triggered it will trigger it as, as an open which is why quite I, as far as I'm concerned open rates they're lovely but, yeah, but it's, it's the click-through that's, that's the key. Yeah, it's just I think, well, I, th I can't remember exactly what it says is the average click-through, but I think it says it's like 3% or something for non really? or something. Really? Okay. Or, that's just what MailChimp says, but it's based, presumably based on their subscribers. So I don't yeah. really know how it breaks it down. Yeah. Well, I think with MailChimp, one of the interesting things about that is that um, a vast majority of people using MailChimp, sort of outside them, are, are people that are using the free accounts. Yeah. And the people that are using the free account, so that's up to about 2,000 uh, subscribers um, uh, without having to pay, yeah. are micro-businesses who are not using it properly. <laughs> and what happens is that tends to drive the numbers down quite, quite significantly. So okay. it, it may well be something within their own system when they look across the board. But generally looking at things, Aweber, Infusionsoft, you know, uh, if you pull those yeah. all together, it's slightly higher. Okay. Um, but if, if you're, I mean, I would be getting you to aim for at least 30% open yeah. and okay. at least 15% click through. Because um, yeah. if you're not getting the click through, yeah. that's where the, the, the information is about the irrelevancy to people. Okay. Um, and I think this sometimes, this is, this is where it comes through because if you've got a lot to say, it's better to say it more often in short bursts, okay? Um, because the most effective <laughs> um, email marketing has um, three or fewer pictures in it <laughs> and about 20 lines of text. Now I always say to my, my clients, it's a picture and 20 lines of text maximum and a click through button. Okay, that, that's it. Because if you're on the train traveling from Liverpool Street to <laughs> Chingford <laughs> and you're squashed in the carriage and you're looking at stuff on your phone and you're doing this, um, which is when a lot of people do this kind of stuff, that's what they can take in. Do you mean 20 lines of text on a smartphone? 20 lines of text full stop. So you design it as 20 lines of text, yeah. Because it goes yeah. Absolutely. And actually, when I'm talking 20 lines of text, it may well be that your call to action is up the top here, so some of the text comes in down the bottom. <coughs> okay. So that's, that's, that's the maximum. Um, and I, the, these are some of the stats I like as well in terms of the number of clicks. Because what 
often happens is that you will get an email from an organisation, perhaps once a month, and they will have their regular stuff that they want to tell you. You know, Charlene's just had a baby and we've got a new member of staff and you know, we've got this new product and all, all, of, all of those kinds. So they chuck everything in because they're only going to do it once a month. And the problem is, is that that has a really significant impact on how effective that email communication is going to be. And the more click options that you put in, the fewer click-throughs you're going to get. So you're much, if, if you've got five things to tell people, send them five messages over a period of time. Okay, because if you put one clickable link in there, you will get a far higher proportion of people clicking through. If you put more than three in there, it's probably just not worth it. And that could be the thing that's impacting um, on, on that click-through rate. Okay? It could also be impacting on the open rate because people might think, oh, it's that thing from so-and-so and so-and-so. Uh, that always takes me ages to read. Um, so I'll wait until I'm at a desktop or something to do that. Um, and, and make it's unre and then it's like read email and then you just keep forgetting about it. Absolutely. You don't, you don't keep it unread and then it's like it vanishes. Yeah. With and the one thing you never do is you never use the word newsletter in the subject line. You never use a month in the subject line unless it's to say, you know, December, uh, November's Black Friday offer or something, something like that. So you do not say July newsletter because that will just dis disappear. I mean, uh, um, I haven't gone into it here. I could do a whole session just on writing subject lines. I've got, I've got, some, I've got some stuff c coming up, but there, there, is, there is an art in that, and um, it will have a severe impact um, on, on whether people will, will, will open it. What it will have an impact on, your subject line, is people's decision to actually read the subject line. Not whether they're going to open the email. <laughs> so um, yeah, keep keep short and sweet, and more often. And actually, in in the background, if you are doing your, um, if you're actually engaging with your your um, community base, and you are segmenting them, then what you can be doing is actually just sending the relevant stuff to that segment rather than what a lot of organisations do is they do some segmenting for certain things so um, it might be a bank and they'll just have their mortgage people or their people that the mortgage is coming up for renewal in 2017 um, but they'll send this one big whacking thing out to everybody on their database about you know all the wonderful things that are happening in the bank and about interest rates and credit cards and, and if you're not interested in interest rates and credit cards then you're just not going to look at it, okay? So do, doing some doing some um, A/B split testing in terms of what your um, uh, the people you're emailing out to can actually give you some fantastic um, uh, information about how you should be segmenting them. Um, the system I, I I actually use Constant Contact myself, and um, not only in that do we have the the list function but the tagging function as well, which means that I can I can drill down quite heavily into the lists to people who are specifically interested in one thing in that list, okay? So I can target them. Might only be sending something out to 10 or 15 people in, in those circumstances, but I, I've gone right down so I know precisely what it is that they're after. Kathy, is um, Constant Contact, is that an email platform? Yes, yeah. It's. Um, it's it's one of it, it does provide emails, but it does more. It has um, uh, Facebook integration, uh, event registration, and um, surveys built into it. That's I, I one stop shop <laughs> um, because I I couldn't face the idea, which I did right back in the beginning of my business, of having a Mailchimp account over here and a SurveyMonkey account over there and a, a an Eventbrite account over here with three or four different lists and people unsubscribing from there and you know you just haven't got time to manage all that so I do it all from one place. Um, it's interesting I've got pictures of a dog, I haven't got a pussy cat, I don't know why. Um, yeah learn from that. <laughs> I'll have to but he was just looking so, oh yes I'm paying attention. Um, 
one of the, the things, um, we talk about the 222 rule <coughs> in terms of um, email marketing. You've got two seconds <coughs> to get people to decide whether they're actually going to read the rest of the subject line. You've then got two words in that subject line which will actually encourage them to think this is relevant to me. Especially on mobile devices when the title is... Precisely. Like and there has to be something in there that makes them want to open it today. So there has to be a, a call to action of, of some sort. Uh, one of my most effective um, subject lines was it just said we need to talk and I got loads of people coming back to me saying what have I done they hadn't read <laughs> about what it did it actually did a great thing because it made uh, quite a few of my past clients re-engage with me and then we had a nice discussion and then I got some more work so you know it, it can it can work in that way but you need to make sure that it's coming out from a recognized sender um, and <laughs> I think the other one there is is, is the next one is that it's um, a, a, a recognised sender and a compelling subject line in com it combined. Because what I, I had a client who had a business, and the business was had quite a long name. Um, and what she did is, rather than using the name, she turned it into an acronym. And she didn't actually include her own name in the from bit. So I was getting these emails from this acronym, and I was deleting them straight off. Who the hell has put me on this list? And it was just before I was about to spam it that she said, oh, you haven't been opening any of my messages. And I said, oh, I haven't been getting anything from you. She said, yeah, there, there they are. And that's, that's what can really, really happen quite often is that we think we're making it easier because we're pushing it into a smaller space. Um, but actually, it really does need to come from something that they know that it's coming from. Okay. Um, um, sorry. Yeah, sorry, that also reminds me, it's like some of the companies, they have this type of way, I don't know, just to make it, maybe make it like closer to our heart that someone is mailing you and you get the email from John Smith and it's like, I don't know any John Smith, but it's John Smith of XYZ. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, it could be a real name, it could be a fake name, it's like they pretended that someone in particular is emailing you. And for me personally, it's actually annoying because it's very confusing me. I hate it yeah. because I know somebody called John Smith isn't sending me that email. Yeah. Hello, I'm Sue from Accounts. Yeah, I haven't got anybody in Accounts called Sue. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. If you if you if you've got a company name and I'm engaged with your company or your organisation, I'll recognise the name of your company yeah. or your organisation. So use that. Mm -hmm. you, you don't have to have this fake. Uh, fake person, yeah, it's like the pop-ups on flipping websites. Shall we chat now? No, I just want to yeah. find a flipping phone number. Um, um, yeah, yeah. one of the uh, the company that I worked before uh, in Poland, it was like, uh, they, I mean, they, they stopped doing it, but they tested it a few times using some of the names. And the, the thing was like, once they, the first time when they did it, they didn't ask my colleague, if, can we use your name? Because it was like, okay, so they are probably the uh, clients, you know, the customers who know these guys. Like, right. And they use his name without asking him if, can we do it? So it was like, I got an email from him and was like, what the hell is going on? And it's just like, he was really pissed off with that. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I, I think we're all, I think we're all intelligent enough to know that it's not real. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think if, if you are representing an organisation and the people that have signed up to receive your emails know that it's that organisation, then it comes from that organisation. Um, add that to the compelling subject line, and it does need to you know do something today. There needs to be an action element in it. Um, timing. Now, you can only test this. Um, I did a whole testing on, on my list um, earlier in the year, and against all of the odds the time that I send my stuff out which is 9.25 on a Monday morning um, should not work but with my customer group it does because the way I, I phrase it and the way I put it together is that it's to help them during the rest of the week in terms of what, what I'm providing them with so that actually does work so there are some um, and I haven't got them to hand but there are some 
sort of standardised things that you can look at that says that if you're in this kind of industry, it quite often works well if you do it on a Thursday at 11 o'clock. There are, there are those. But one of the best ways to do it is to actually just do some A-B testing and send some stuff out um, at a variety of, variety of times and then test your days because you'll, you'll come across when, when will be the optimum time, when you'll actually um, get your open rate higher up there. Um, and make things easy for them to take action. Nice, great, big, fat buttons that say, do this now. <laughs> um, the one thing I learned quite early on is don't be British about it. Don't um, use nice, soft language. Um, in fact, we're getting very, very used now to this much more directive, do this, click this, download, those, those kinds of things. So you can actually make that work. Um, and um, the whole idea about people knowing it's the from name, as I said, is it's exactly the same as what you would be using in any of your other um, platforms. So don't differentiate. If you're using a particular name on your Facebook page or your YouTube channel um, or on your LinkedIn company profile or, or anything like that, then use exactly the same on, on email. It's, you know, it's standard. It's about consistency and consistency of branding as much as anything. Um, nice people having nice cups of coffee and things. And I think that it's really um, a key thing to say is that the open rate will be based on that subject line. So who's it from? Does it look as if it's going to be interesting or not? For me, the other thing about um, this, whether it's worth reading, um, is the pre-header text. Because a lot of people are using, you know, being quite savvy about how they're using the subject line. But what they're forgetting to do is to make changes to the pre-header text. And that can be where you can give people more of a taster of what they're likely to get inside the message. So do you know what I mean by the pre-header text? When you've got your email inbox, when you've got your email inbox, what you'll actually have you can see that is that you have your files on here um, and if you're like me you've got your preview over here and then you'll have your like from list here and actually what the first thing you'll have is is the name then you'll have the subject and then underneath the subject or the, the header text you'll have a little bit of text that sits underneath there now that is a standard text that just sits in there, but actually in most of the email service providers, there is um, a place where you can actually put in your own pre headed text. So what that means is that you can keep your subject line nice and short and succinct and have a strong call to action in there. And then you can give them a little bit more information about why they should be opening this email in the pre headed text. Okay, um, it does have a really significant impact on, on your open rates, so I'll make sure that you you, 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 uh, you check that out if you're not using it. Um, yeah, size always matters. Um, it's about keeping it short, 30 to 40 characters, 6 to 10 words, and as I say, control that pre headed text. Um, the way things look, consistency is absolute across across everything. So you need to make sure that if you've got a website that looks like something, the email looks just like the website. Um, particularly if it's then appearing in this preview screen here. Okay, And that then has an impact on some of the things that you need to be including in there. So for example, um, with a logo, you'll always either have it in the centre or on the left hand side because in that preview screen it will cut that half of the um, email off. So if you're sticking your important information over on the top right hand side, people won't necessarily recognise it. The, thing to, the way people react to things, number one that they react to is colour. You know, our brains react to colour first, then they react to shape. 
okay? And then they get into much more specifics like words. So this is one of the reasons why you need to ensure that there is definitely a colour match <laughs> in any of the emails that you're, that you're sending out. Um, and if you can include your organisation name within the logo, because not all... Um, not all organisations actually include their name in there. They'll have some kind of visual identity. Uh, but if you can get, you know, if you have awful things like communications teams, whose job seems to be never to communicate, who make decisions over whether you can use logos and things in certain ways. Um, for this kind of thing, actually having something that does include your, your organisation name is actually quite key. All right. Um, it's about making sure that everything that you have that's important sits above the fault. Okay? In exactly the same way as it would on a, um, on a website. I saw a website today and I nearly fell off my chair in horror because um, all, all the important stuff was in the footer. But it took me like three scrolls to get to the bottom of the page because there was so much information on there. And I'm doing some work with this uh, client in the next couple of weeks, and it's it's the fundamental error, <laughs> you know, that all the important stuff is down the bottom. You want people to take action, so you stick it there, there at the top. Fancy some of those? They're actually cupcakes with a macaroon top. I don't know when we started calling them macarons, but they've got a macaroon top, um, which I think is lovely. Um, Pictures, clickable links. I mean, I'm probably preaching to the converted here, but definitely every image that you include has to be a cl clickable link. Because, again, what the statistics are showing is that even if that image is a clickable link through to the same thing that the button clicker is through to, people will click the image more than they'll click the button. Okay? And this is because people are becoming far more visually literate. So, um, you know, we know that things like imagery is being shared so much more on, on social media. That's why we've got the growth of the visual-based ones anyway. So, yes, you make, make those clickable. Um, the other thing is um, text labels. So a lot of um, emails will go into um, email inboxes where they will suppress the images until somebody says, yeah, download the pictures. And that's you know, so security feature as much as anything else. But if you don't stick the image label at the back of the image, people aren't going to be sure what the image is. So you can actually get around that by saying, um, you know, it's a, it's a picture of beautiful cup of rooms or, or whatever. So you, you actually make sure that it's a bit like putting the alt tag at the back of um, an image on your website. We do exactly the same in, in here. Okay. Visuals that has to look exactly the same wh wherever it's going, whatever the side. And I think with, um, do any of you use videos in your emails? I encourage you to consider it because they're really, really effective. <laughs> um, and people will click on those far more then they will click on exactly the same words written within, within that email. Um, people love to watch videos. So, and most of the um, email uh, service providers will actually um, include uh, a link through to uh, YouTube so that you can embed the, the video into the email. Okay, so it's, it's actually a really nice way to deliver stuff. And again, looks good on all types of devices. Um, this is my philosophy. You know, write it once and use it many times. If you are using it on your website, if you're, if you're using it as part of your blog, if you're posting it out on Facebook, if you're putting it up on Twitter, using the pictures on Instagram or Pinterest or any of those other things, then this can be the stuff that becomes the body of the newsletter that you're sending out. Purely because of what I said right at the beginning, because some of your community will engage with you on Facebook. And some of them will engage with you via your website, and some of them will engage with you via some of the other social platforms. But the place where you'll get to most of them in one hit will be in their inbox. 
Is there, yeah. if you've got someone who's, say, following you on Twitter and your Facebook page and uh, getting your email, is there a danger in the repetition in the content, though? Not really. Or is it more the marketing thing of actually, if I see it three times, I'm more likely to engage? Yeah, yeah. and actually, even more than three times now, we're looking at 12 because of the mm. amount of um, content that people are being delivered. Right, yeah. So we need more touch points. Mm. And the fact is that there will be a fair proportion of people who will only ever see it in one place because they will only engage. Or they'll see it as a slightly different... Um, the funny thing is they see it as, as different when they look at it. So I have people that go and look at my stuff via Facebook. So they'll click on the link and they'll look at it that way. Mm. And I'll see that they've done exactly the same in their inbox. <laughs> Oh, right. um, so they, they, they will come at it from, from, from different places. Mm. And what I, what I do, you know, is, is I, I, I'll strip it down so that mm. um, if I'm using my blog as the content yeah. for my stuff that I send out, which I do, so I take basically the first two sentences of my blog with a, like a read more or discover more or something button on it. The image that I use will be the image that I use at the top of the blog, it, you know, featured image. It will be the, the image that I'll use at the top of the newsletter. Mm -hmm. That image then will be just that image over onto Pinterest, which yeah. will be a link back to the blog, not necessarily to the newsletter. And the same in Facebook, it might just be the image that I use rather than the whole newsletter itself, but the image will be a click back through to the blog. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because and it's it's with all of these things is that the, the website is the heart of the organization and most of your solid information is sitting there on the website okay so what you're actually doing with all of this stuff is pushing people towards your shop window because it's only when they get there that they're going to see all of the things that you do and the things that you can offer them so every one of these things that we're doing to actually encourage people to um, engage with us and come and join with us is is that push towards back towards the website okay mm. um, yeah making it mobile and I think for me the interesting thing here this is the same message <laughs> okay can you see the difference in that so we've got here yeah it's a headstand workshop and in the first one here on the the right hand side one is it the right hand side or the, your left hand side um we've got all this lovely text telling us about what it's going to involve and what's going to be in the headstand workshop and all of those kinds of things and i remember when we were prepared to pinch and click <laughs> but we're not anymore and in the same way we're actually quite often not prepared to push the screen up okay um so if I want people to come to my headstand workshop, I want them to know the very, very top level basic stuff, when it is and where it is and how they book, okay? So that information is useful and it can sit further down, <laughs> but I wouldn't have that, I wouldn't have that at the top. So thinking about, as I said before, it's about designing for this kind of tablet or uh, phone means that it will look good on any device. Again. <laughs> um, yeah, move out of multiple columns because even if it's a multiple column responsive email template, it they still tend to push things into odd places. And if you're using multiple columns, you're probably sending out too much information anyway, uh, because you're having to separate it out by separate it out by columns. Um, easy uh, call to action: font size. Okay, um, I do nothing less than 14 point, because when it comes down to a mobile device, you're looking at at least 12 on, on there, and people can read it. If you're actually putting stuff in on 12 or 10 point, people just can't see it. Okay, so, so do, do that, and you know, big headings, those, those kinds of things. Um, and good, good images, care, the images that make sense to what you're actually sending out, uh, because sometimes you get some rather strange ones coming through. So, um, 
that was what I had to say. I hope that was okay. If anybody's got any questions now, I'm more than happy to um, answer them. I know that we are going to have a bit of a Q&A, but was there anything sort of that I haven't covered that you might have questions about? Okay. Well, Christy told me to do this, so this is this is um, what she told me to do. And she told me to tell you um, that if you want to uh, have a trial of constant contact, they have a free trial, a 60-day free trial, and you, you're more than welcome to sign up for that. And you can use that um, that link to do that. Um, and don't tell anyone because this isn't allowed for you to know this yet. Um, but there's a 40% discount for three months. Um, but you can only do it if you sign up next from next Monday because it's like their Cyber Monday Small Business Saturday offer. But I thought it was too close not to let you know that it was available. So if any of you want to give it a go, um, you know, you can get three months worth for next to nothing, basically, almost half price. So so that, that is there for you if you wish. And if any of you want any information about that, um, just, just, uh, just ask me, I'm more than happy to answer those questions and that's me so I hope that was hope that was okay um, and look forward to some questions afterwards. Mm -hmm.